Hi, my name is Blue Jay Robinson, and today I'll be covering how to use DIC to measure operational deflection shapes as analyzed with window functions. I'll quickly discuss 3D DIC, what it is, how it works, and VIC3D system specifications, how to set up the system, and then I'll show you data from two application examples. After that, we'll cover what to do with the data and why it's useful. So what is DIC? It's a non-contact method to calculate surface strains and deformations on nearly any sample. If the sample is visible to cameras and can have a speckle pattern applied to the surface, we can get data. At the top right, we see a patch of asphalt with a natural speckle pattern which is used to get data. And in the bottom right, we see a typical forming application. It's common to have forming limit diagrams created from this kind of data. The way DIC works is that we have two cameras that have an overlapping field of view synchronously capturing images of a speckle pattern. We can think of the speckle pattern being broken up into a bunch of pixels. If we look at small groups of pixels, which are called subsets, we can think of each subset as a single data point. If each subset overlaps with surrounding subsets, this is what allows us to get full field data that is typically associated with the DIC method. Data that we get from these subsets is based on how the speckle pattern moves over time and through space. We can also use this technique to calculate curvatures, velocities, accelerations, since we have a steady predictable frame rate capture. And you can even generate your own functions using data obtained from external sensors, like load data or strain gauge data, to find variables not available by default in VIC3D. Currently, low-speed cameras can have up to roughly 30 million points in an image, and high-speed cameras can have up to about 4 million points in an image. We aim to get about 200 images per test. For example, if we take a series of images of a sample undergoing tensile deformation, we can call the first image in the sequence the reference image. Each subsequent image will be compared to the reference image to detect motion of the speckle pattern using subsets. We can visualize the overlapping subsets in the reference image so we can measure x, y, and z positions of each point on our surface. What we're doing here is measuring the shape of the surface of the sample. If we do the same thing in the deformed images, then we can see how the same points move over time. If we subtract the deformed positions from the original positions, that gives us displacements. Once we have these delta L's, we can divide them by our initial lengths to calculate the strains. This has been done for quite some time with low-speed cameras. And just like how low-speed cameras capture images, high-speed cameras allow us to capture images too, albeit much more quickly. Obviously, these cameras are more useful for very fast tests. They're typically much heavier, larger, and require more robust mounting solutions. They're also more expensive. While high-speed cameras can currently capture useful data up to about 100,000 frames a second, Ultra high speed cameras currently capture useful data sets up to about 5 million frames per second. Diving right into our first application example, we use a pair of high speed cameras to measure the strain, deformation, and operation deflection shapes on a heavy duty brake rotor. This was a bit of a tough test because we did not know what frequencies to expect, so we just captured 3,000 images at a rate of 10,000 frames per second. We captured images this fast because we have to capture images at about 2.5 times faster than our highest expected frequency in order to avoid aliasing. With an i7 processor, I processed all these images in about 45 minutes, but a faster processor will show data quicker. The great thing about this kind of measurement technology is that we can simply tap the part with a hammer, capture images for a few seconds, and then move on to the post-processing. There's no scanning of the part, and strains are produced automatically. This is what that setup looked like for this test. We have the cameras connected to the PC, the high-powered LEDs, and cameras pointed at the sample, and the sample has a speckle pattern on its surface. Along with this hardware, we provide calibration grids, lenses, mounting, and a few other accessories with the system. After we have a good setup, which involves pointing the cameras at the sample, applying a great speckle pattern, and focusing on the speckle pattern to get a nice, crisp image, calibrating the system involves capturing images of a calibration grid with high tilts about all three axes in place of the speckle pattern. Once the system is calibrated, we can run our test, which might involve a chirp, a hammer, or a drop, just something that will produce a transient vibration. After we capture images of the vibration, the high-speed cameras will have these stored on their internal memory buffers. So we choose which images we'd like to download from the cameras to the PC. We import those images into the VIC3D system and run them. This allows us to see the shape, displacements, and velocities, and strains in the time domain. Once we have that, we can perform the FFT analysis on the time history of the displacements to get data in the frequency domain. To explain how we go from the time domain to the frequency domain in a bit more detail, I'll use a single point as an example. 
If we extract a single point in the time domain to find the displacements in the x, y, and z axes, we can see that point's displacements, u, v, and w, respectively, over time. Once we have this, if we perform an FFT on the time history of these displacements, we can produce a very high resolution graph of what these points are doing in the frequency domain. We can do this for every point on the sample surface to see the operation deflection shapes. Plus, we get acceleration and strain data that we can view in the frequency domain as well. When the FFT analysis was performed on the brake rotor, we got three really nice distinct amplitude peaks at 120 Hz, 932 Hz, and 2087 Hz. The highest frequency shape produced the smallest amplitude and was the noisiest, as you might expect. We can see that a very tiny amplitude is measured here at only about 25 nanometers. This slide shows the 2D and 3D animations of what each shape at their respective frequencies looks like. Having the 2D data overlay allows us to see clearly where the nodes are for each shape. We can see this best illustrated the shape at 932 hertz. So what do we do with this data? By default, the average amplitude is shown in the graph. If we want to investigate a single point's amplitude and phase, we can extract that with a point marker. We can do this for several points and also set any point as a reference to which we can compare the others. In the second application example, we'll cover how windowing affects our data. I wanted to cover a spinning fan for this application for a couple of reasons. One, the geometry is complex, and two, where the constant rotation might present more traditional measurement techniques and very difficult challenges. It's not a problem at all for the VIC-3D high-speed FFT system. The excitation for this test was simply providing power to the fan. This allows us to see the run-up effect each time the fan is activated. Again in this example, we didn't know what frequencies to expect, so 2000 frames were captured at a rate of 6400 frames per second, and it took about 30 minutes to process this image set. In this slide, we see a 3D shape measurement of the fan in the z-direction in the top right, and the 2D data overlay for displacements in the z-direction in the top left. If we extract the average displacement in the z-direction over time, we see the graph at the bottom. We can see that the fan is wobbling a bit with each cycle, but generally the fan does have a cyclic out-of-plane motion. If we perform the FFT on this data with no windows applied, we get some really nice looking peaks in the frequency domain that are all between 33 and 560 Hz. This is expected because the fan isn't spinning too quickly. I've highlighted five of these peaks so we can look at them in more detail. Here, we see these five peaks animated in a 2D view with the data overlaid on each image. Going back to our graph, we can focus on the ODS occurring at 556 Hz. I've resized the graph here to make the peak that occurs more obvious in the below graph. We see that it has a small double peak, but if we put our cursor on the higher of the two, we can animate the average amplitude of this frequency. When we do this, we get to see the full field data in the frequency domain. In the top left, we see the 2D data overlaid on the image, and in the top right, we see the 3D shape. Now, if we perform the same analysis, except we apply a hand window to the data, we see that the frequency is shifted slightly to the left to 546.5 Hz, and we see that the amplitude is changed from 350 nanometers to about 200 nanometers, but the shape is still relatively the same. If we perform the analysis again, this time using a Hamming window, we basically have the same shape. We see there's not a big difference in the frequency or amplitude for the Han and Hamming windows. We've also obtained measurements on many other types of applications. Here we see a mounted tire, a turbine blade, and a cantilevered beam all being excited with a hammer tap. In the bottom right, we see a mounted model jet being excited by a shaker. So what do we do with all this data? The first thing we want to do is pair it with other data from external sensors. Using a BNC connection with a plus or minus 10 volt signal, we can synchronize our images with LDVs, strain gauges, modal hammers, things like that. We can then either import this data into VIC-3D, or we can export the time domain data and frequency domain data from VIC-3D into another program. So depending on the cameras we're using, we can get the system cost down to about $100,000. That should get us about 2,500 frames per second and about 1,000 hertz. Post-processing will be fairly quick, and the strain resolution is about 20 micro strain. Surface geometry usually poses no issues as long as both cameras get enough pixels across the speckle pattern, and we get a ton of data points. It's all full field. I've hinted at the comparison between our system and scanning laser systems, but you can see in this table how they differ a little bit more directly. 
This slide also helps to summarize some of the more noteworthy aspects of the VIC-3D high-speed FFT system. We want to sell it as a turnkey system so you'll get all the software and hardware that you need, right out of the box. We come on-site to perform a two-day training seminar and also include one year of support with the system. Additionally, all the hardware has a two-year warranty. To find out more about the patented VIC-3D high-speed FFT system with Windowing, I encourage you to send me an email or just give us a call so we can discuss your application in more detail. Once we know more about your project, we can provide an on-site demonstration of our system. You can also check out our growing online library of DIC training videos and instructional videos at CorrelatedSolutions.com. Also, we're really proud of the fact that Correlated Solutions co-founders Hubert Schreier and Michael Sutton literally helped write the book on DIC technology. We've also heavily contributed to the International Digital Image Correlation Society's Good Practices Guide, which is available for free online. We'll put that link in the comment section below. That's all I have. Thank you for taking some time with us today, and we look forward to working with you in the future.